This is to be a recording of Mr. Ernest, Ernest Boyer, who lives here in Fort Valley. And uh, he's one of our senior citizens, and we hope to get some information on how things were in the past. Uh, Mr. Boyer, will you tell me who your mother and father were? My father was Samuel Boyer, and my mother was Charlotte Munch. Uh -huh. And uh, when were you born? 1903. 1903. And you still, uh, did, were you born in this house, your present home, or did you born, born, where else were you born? No, my father's home was up where my brother, younger brother lives. I was born there and moved here in 1935 when I was married. 1935. Mm -hmm. And, of course, you lived here then in your old home and uh, went to school. Where did you go to school? Went to school at Slate Hill, a one-room school where the farm, the farm here surrounds it. Mm -hmm. Oh, the Slate Hill School is on your present property. You're close to your it, It's surrounded. Property. It was given from an acreage, uh, nearly an acre from this farm for a school. Uh, could you tell us uh, a typical day at school when you were at Slate Hill? Can you describe yeah. the schoolhouse and what school was like, where you got your books and so forth? The books came from Woodstock. They gave us a list of what books were needed. And my dad usually went over and got them just before school started which was usually around 15th or 20th of October. And I'd go barefoot to school the first month. And we'd get there. I can't tell you precisely the schedule, but we'd have classes for an hour or so, and then 10-minute recess, classes again till noon, and an hour for a noon recess, classes again for an hour or so, and another 10-minute recess and classes again. The school day started at 9 and ended at 4. 9 and ended at 4. What kind of it? Was it a one-room school? One-room school, and there were some 40 or 45 pupils that attended. Anywhere from 6 to 20 years of age. I believe there were a few of them over 20. Was that one teacher? One teacher. Would, would, would all of them spend the same length of school year, or would they come at different times? The older boys wouldn't come until around Thanksgiving, and they'd fade out long about the first of March, maybe a rainy day or two come along in the spring, and they'd be back. To, they'd get three, maybe four months of school, about three months of school. Was that a frame school or a brick school? It's a frame school. Frame building. Uh, it was heated with old wood lawn cast iron stove. That uh, roasted you in front and you froze <laughs> in the back. <laughs> well, who furnished the wood? The school board uh, usually had a contract with some one of the members to furnish wood. Mm -hmm. And originally the school teacher had to cut it, but when I was going to school, uh, the one who furnished it, Furnished it cut. Was there more than one school here in the area? More than was other than Slate Hill? There were seven one-room schools originally. Could you tell us what they were? Their names? I can't give you any more of the names of all of them. I'll give you those in this end. This end was Slate Hill and Promised Land about two miles above. Why do they call it Promised Land? I understood it's an name. that someone promised the land for it, and then when the time came to build a schoolhouse, they reneged on the promise. That's an interesting story. Bill uh, Coverstone told me the story that uh, his dad had uh, promised that he would give them some acreage, I think two or three acres, and when they came up, um, they wouldn't accept the piece of property that he wanted to give them. They wanted a different piece, and uh, he wouldn't give it to them, and so they bought it from him, and he made them pay for the second piece, and that's, <laughs> that's why they called it the Promised Land School, <laughs> according to Bill. 
Well, that voice you just heard was Bill Evans, who was here with me interviewing Mr. Boyer. Then uh, any other school you recall? Dry Run. Dry Run. A couple miles farther up. And then Crossroads School, up uh, where the present school now is. Then above that was Keller's. And I can't remember to give you definitely the two upper ones. Uh -huh. You mentioned that there was a possibility of a Pine Hill. Does that mean anything to I, you? I think probably they had a school there and at Oak Level. Mm -hmm. okay. You must have had a pretty good uh, child population in the area to support so many schools so close together. For instance, from here to... Uh, uh, dry Run is only three miles, isn't it? At that time, I suspect there were about 1,500 persons lived here, and most of them had sizable families. Uh -huh. Nowadays, there's at least that many people live here, but a number of them are senior citizens uh, retired here mm -hmm. for the beauty of the place and the quiet. Um. This one-room school, did you ever, ever have any night activities like uh, classroom activities or parents' night? How was, the, how was the thing lighted up and uh, any social affairs? No, I don't believe we did. But they did have Sunday school down here at times in this uh, building. It was a non-denominational Sunday school and held in the on Sunday afternoons, mm -hmm. people walked uh, just the same as they did to the school, and we'd have a Christmas program on us. Well, they had religion in the school in those days. Uh, not in that they held a Sunday school, in the, but they held it on Sundays. They didn't have it as a part of the school program. Oh, the Christmas exercise then was a church activity and not a school activity. That's right. Mm -hmm. You said something about uh, you were a pretty good reader. You read quite a few books. Can you tell us where you got all this source and all this interest? I always did enjoy reading. In fact, when I started the school, I probably, at six, I probably would have qualified for the fourth grade, but we didn't have any grades in those times. <laughs> and I kept reading. They got a library just well, about the time I was... 10, I suppose, and I read most of the books in that library because I was already finished as far as uh, instruction in the one-room school was concerned. You must have had a good home relationship here with all the uh, interest in reading. What, uh, what stimulated your interest in books? I don't know. My older brother got started to school and... Uh, he brought his books home, and I was just interested in it. My dad taught school for, I think, 13 years, so he was pretty well qualified to get me started, but I was just always interested in it. Were there any um, libraries in the area other than this one in the school when you were a youngster? To my knowledge, no. Well, what about some of the homes? Did, did some of the families, like your father, have uh, private libraries that other people could come and borrow their books and, on occasion? He had quite a few books that I know of, and some of them were quite advanced. But I don't recall anyone coming to borrow them. Did you have uh, uh, a piano in your home? We had an organ. I had an organ. Did, who played it? <laughs> uh, my sister became pretty good at it. Now, who was your sister? Edith uh, Burke lives at Woodstock. Yeah. Was I she older or younger? She's a year older than I. Uh -huh. I took a few lessons, so did my younger brother. But neither one of us were <laughs> the type that could <laughs> make our fingers work on the keys. <laughs> we learned to read music, and that, that's helped out yeah. because we do enjoy singing. Oh, that brings up a good point, Marlon. Um, uh, Ernie uh, 
and Sam were in a in a quartet here for many years and, and won some honors. When did you first start singing in a group? I expect about 1924. Uh-huh. Now, when you say group, was this a quartet, quartet. or a chorus? Oh. They, they had a quartet at that time, and uh, Sam and I met with them for a few years. And, uh, well, at one time we worked up to a double quartet. We had two, I think, on each part. And then the older members dropped out, and it just left uh, my brother and I, John D. Clem and Roy Rinker. There never was a Fort Valley chorus then. Not in that sense, uh -huh. no. But this quartet that you had, uh, that lasted right up through World War II, didn't it? Uh, yes, I believe it did. When did you go to Richmond and, and compete over there? Was that before the war or after? After. After the war. I can't tell you the precise year. Uh -huh. And what kind of a competition was it? Statewide? Uh, six states. Six states? Uh, this this one was... What competition was it? Statewide? Uh, it was six states. Six states? Uh, this this one was... Uh, yeah, it was six states. Uh -huh. The southern states put it on, and the first at the local level at each store, and then uh, a regional level, and uh, then they got them all together at uh, Richmond, which was headquarters for the southern states at the mosque, for uh, the finals. And, and did you reach the finals? We reached the finals, but we were pretty far down the list. In the <laughs> well, I mean, that was quite an honor, wasn't it? It was. Yeah. I think that was the largest audience we ever sang to, approximately 5,000. Oh, my. Can you imagine? That was something. That? Quite a thrill, I would imagine. Yeah. yeah. And I can remember the little girl that won. She was only 13, and she had the ventriloquist dummy. Mm -hmm. And at the close, she and the dummy sang a duet. Um, that clear. That's interesting. Well, now, uh, your, your people had something to do with what we call the Boyer Church. Can you tell us something about the Boyer Church? If I don't get my facts uh, mixed up, I may be in error in some points. Well, we won't know. <laughs> I don't recall that far. I wasn't born at that time, but as I understand, there were about 27 or 28 that uh, split off from the Disciple Christian Church and formed uh, their own denomination, and that was in 1878. They'd that come under the, the influence of uh, an evangelist, pretty well known in the valley at that time, I believe J.M. Morgan. And was he from North Carolina? That I can't tell. You. And that was the beginning in the valley of the Church of God. That was the beginning in the valley of the Church of God. And that's your church now. And then so you're celebrating your 100th anniversary, and that's what you're working on. Uh, that's or, or Lucille's working on. Or that will be uh, the 15th, 15th of this October. Yeah. Uh, uh, Mr. Boyer, how many churches can you recall that were or are in existence here in the valley? In this valley, there would be about seven, I guess. Seven? Uh-huh. Can you name some of them and locate them for us? The one is no longer here, the Disciple Christian Discontinued Services uh -huh. since the turn of the century. Then the Church of God, and what is now the United Church of Christ, the Methodist Church, the Church of the Brethren, the Brethren Church. There were two branches of the Lutheran Church, which are now merged into one. Now known as the Faith Lutheran? And now known as Faith Lutheran. 
Were there any churches between here and the downstream? No. Not very many people live down in there. Uh, not since I can recall. There were at, uh, when the Elizabeth Furnace was in operation, there were quite a few cabins and homes down there oh, then. Yeah. But uh, I think they came to an end at about the same time that the Boyer Furnace did, at the time of the discovery of iron ore in west of Lake Superior, in the Sabe Range. Oh, that's the price of pig iron just about cut in two, and it was no longer profitable to work these small. Oh, wonder uh, what year that would have been. I think about 1892 or 93. Uh -huh. So these furnaces all operated up until about that time. Huh? I think that's right. Uh -huh. uh, well, now we're talking about furnaces. There is a Boyer furnace, isn't there? Yes. Can you tell us anything about that? And where is it located? It's about two miles from home, of which would make it around ten miles from Route 55 at Water Lake. On the road from the Fort Valley through to Woodstock. At that time, my grandfather operated that. Did he build it? He built it. He built it. Good. And uh, also operated a grist mill and a store there. The I wonder mill. when it was established. When do you suppose it was first built? I don't know. I'm not able to tell you. I think Frank Foyer probably could. Uh huh. But they had an overshot water wheel there that they used for grinding. In the mill race, you can still see the remains where it comes down through the gap. And they call those water wheels the Pelton wheel, so they had a post office there at that time, and that was named Pelton Post Office. So that's where oh. it's got its name. Well, I'm familiar with So the, then wheel. the Pelton Post Office is generated by the Boyer Furnace. Yeah, it was originally uh -huh. there. Oh, good boy. Yeah. Later, it was moved when they discontinued the furnace. It was moved to uh, Madison Cover Stone Place, where Mrs. William Coverstone lives now. Oh. And at his death, then it came to my father's home, where my brother lives now. That would be Sam. Yeah. So all of those houses up in there go back into the past century, don't they? I would to say so, yeah. Uh, can you tell us about when the telephones came through this country and what were they like? They, they weren't were, automatic, were they? <laughs> no. They were here when I could first remember a few of them, not so many. And uh, there were two lines, an independent line was about four or five on, which my father was on, and then the mutual line, which was more on, and they had a switchboard up at uh, Crossroads, or Detrick, a man by an operator. Could you call over to Woodstock then? We could, going through the switchboard. Going through them. They could get into Woodstock. And sometimes we could hear. <laughs> Sometimes you could hear. Sometimes How about Strasburg? Could, could you call Strasburg? Just well not try. Uh, How would you arouse the uh, the operator? You rang uh, one of these coffee grinder telephones, you rang two long rings. Paused and two long rings, usually about second or third time. She'd answer. But did you always have to go through the operator if you wanted to talk to somebody, or could you just ring a, a long and a short or something? On uh, the independent line, why well, we could ring those as a party line. But if we wanted to go to the mutual line, we had to go through the switchboard. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so if you wanted to talk to uh, some of your relatives in Woodstock, you would call the operator and they would ring your relatives. Yeah. Uh, and if the uh, weather was good and the lines were dry, we probably could hear. <laughs> 
Sometimes we wonder if they're as good today as they were then. <laughs> oh, there's no comparison. No, no, no. not at all. No. Uh, Let me ask you, yeah. what was the first automobile that your family had? A 1918 Model T Ford. <laughs> 1918, huh? A lot of people had that for their first car. You got out and cranked that thing. Yes. Did you have to take a driver's license to learn to drive? No. I didn't learn at that time. But you got your own car? I got my own car in 1929. I learned at that time. Uh -huh. What was that? That was a Model A. Model A? Mm -hmm. Bought it new then. Because they came out in 1929. Uh, I believe 500 and some dollars. Yes. As I remember yeah. that. Yeah. Well, you and I bought our cars the same year. Well, I bought, But I bought a 1925 Model T in 1929. <laughs> That's all I could afford. <laughs> when did the electricity come through the valley? We had a Delco put in about 1914. Well, that was a private electricity. That was private electricity, uh -huh. but we really enjoyed it. Did you have it uh, hooked up to your barn? Yes. Uh -huh. Had battery power. Mm -hmm. And you only ran it for an hour or so in the evening, uh, or a couple of hours? Well, we'd run it whenever it showed it was beginning to get down, depending on how much current we used. Oh, I see. Well, when did the when did the real commercial electricity come through? I believe we hooked up in the spring of 1941. Now this is a part of the uh, of Chendo the Chendo Valley Electric Cooperative, uh -huh. Uh -huh. which is the Tennessee Valley Authority. No, no, no. Rural Electrification Administration, oh, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Did uh, did well prior to prior to your Delco and the uh, electricity? What were some of the sources of energy that you had? Certainly not solar heating very much. No, well, we fuel just like I do now with wood. But the stoves weren't as good as we have now. And we used kerosene lamps for light. When did the first Aladdin lamps come out? Did you have them as far back as you could remember? I don't know when they first came out. I can remember the first one we had, and I was about six or seven, which would have been 1916 or 1917. You had to pump up the base. Well, that, that's a bit of a different uh, affair from... Yeah. Yeah, I, I remember seeing those. That was gasoline. That was gasoline. Had mantles on it. Had two mantles. I suppose. I don't yeah. But this Aladdin, this Aladdin, uh, you just filled it like you did your regular kerosene, uh -huh. right? And it burned till it burned it out. Had a round wick. Yeah. But with the Delco, we even hooked up the lights to the chicken house to give them light at night so that they would lay through the winter or something unheard of in those days. Yes. You made, uh, you, ma you made the chickens work overtime. We brought them up in the fall in two weeks' time from all 2% production to better than 50%. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. Uh, when did the uh, family get its first tractor? When did you go from horses to tractors? Did you have an old steam engine? No. You went to gasoline. We got an old uh, iron wheel forts in about 1924. That might be a year uh, out, but that's about the time. But, uh, Somebody in the fort probably had uh, the old steam tractor that uh, pulled the, the uh, uh, thrasher yeah, around. Yeah, we called those traction engines. They were quite a heavy yeah. machine and steam powered. And they pulled a grain separator, a thrashing machine around. And Was there somebody within the fort who did the thrashing? There were two or three different rigs at that time because there was quite a bit of wheat grown. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know if there was any wheat grown at all in the fort this year, or if it was, not in this end. But then there was enough wheat to keep them busy for at least two months of the year. Well, uh, now, did you have a mower, or how would you, uh, how would you uh, process your heat? When harvest time came around, what did you have to do? We had a binder. My, Is that pulled by horses? That's pulled by horses. I believe my 
granddad and my Uncle Dave Warrior got one of those old McCormick Reapers, which was antedated the binder. Uh -huh. It uh, cut the grain, but there had to be someone to pull it off, and then it had to be bound by hand. Oh. But it uh, relieved the man who was running the grain cradle. Mm -hmm. but, uh, we had uh, one of the first binders, and I think he was on the second binder when I could remember. You just mentioned a grain cradle. What's a grain cradle? It's the way they used to cut wheat. Uh, I'd like to tell us about your experiences here in Fort Valley. You, uh, when you were a boy, you'd work a day. You just mentioned a grain cradle. What's a grain cradle? It's the way they used to cut wheat. In my dad and my grandfather's day, before that, they used the sickle. But, uh, the grain cradler swings that. It's a, a long blade, and there's uh, four or five fingers out to catch the grain. And a good cradler, as I say, can cut three acres of grain a day. A very good cradler can cut, cut three and a half, and a darn good cradler can cut four acres a day. <laughs> he has to have a sharp blade, doesn't he? They knew how to sharpen it, yeah. and that is good metal. My dad must have had a couple epithets because he, he cut as much as five acres a day, wow. and one neighbor cut six. Oh, gee! He put he knew he, he knew he put in a day's work then, didn't he? I'm sure they did. What time would a typical day on the farm uh, last? From how? What time did you get up in the morning, and uh, what would you do before you went out into the fields? And when would your day end? They say man works from sun to sun, and uh, most of them uh, in harvest time and seeding time got up before daybreak and worked till after dark. But uh, in those days, most of them had two busy seasons a year, each one lasting about a month, and in between time, uh, they took it easy. Repaired their equipment? Yes, and they did quite a bit of hunting and fishing. And so it wasn't so, all that bad, was it? I can remember my dad's folks come to visit him, and uh, one group stay maybe three, four, or five days, and another group come maybe next week, and then he'd go there and visit for a few weeks. A lot of socializing then. There was, really. We had time to socialize. Now we don't. Uh -huh. And we've lost something. We've lost quite a bit. You were talking here well, before we made this interview about your horses, how many horses did you have on the farm when you when you were a boy? And how many did you have for your own? Normally, we kept uh, six or seven, and there were usually a few colts around besides. And we had a hired man, and he would send him out with a four-horse team. The lumbering business was pretty good in those days. They cut quite a bit of lumber. When he hauled lumber at the markets, he didn't have any trucks. But when the farm work required it, we pulled him off. He helped on the farm with those four horses, so we could get quite a bit of farm work done. You had some Morgans, did you? Uh, in those days, the federal government had a cavalry station at Front Royal, and they kept Morgan horses there for breeding, and they, bred, they bred the farmers' horses in the hopes of getting cavalry, cavalry mounts. And at three years of age, you took the horses, the geldings, out, and they checked them. If they passed inspection, they paid you a very good price for them. If they didn't, you had your horse with no service charge. And those horses could take the heat. They were very good workers. Mm -hmm. The mare folks they weren't interested in. How much did a horse, a Morgan, weigh? Around a thousand pounds. But uh, these farm chunks and the cavalry horses would go on up maybe 11 or 1,200. Is that right? Yeah. They, they were big animals, weren't they? But uh, some of ours Past and some of them got just a little too big, they wouldn't take them. Uh -huh. I know the best horse that we had here 
was just a hand too high. That was all we held. He was just too tall for a cavalry horse. And his mate, when we broke together, wasn't quite that tall. And they took him. Oh. But we had three others of the same breeding. And uh, they weren't interested in those. They were too large. That was called a remount station, wasn't it? Called a remount and is that where the, um, the old beef cattle farm was? Yes, they followed that with uh, beef cattle research. And now they're dividing it up into different things, but they have some uh, wildlife there. Yeah. You're going to have a big 4 H center there now. I believe they are. Well, now can we go back a little bit? Uh, I didn't realize that we had a high school here in Fort Valley. There was uh, never an accredited high school. But for those, until the buses came, for those who couldn't get out, it was a means of them getting some education beyond eighth grade. In fact, there weren't any grades when I went to school. Did anybody go to college who hadn't gone to Woodstock uh, High School? I mean, anybody going into advanced uh, education? Maybe directly from Fort Valley School? Not that I know. Uh, something was mentioned here about the flu in 1918. Can you tell us how the valley survived that? Here in Fort Valley. They closed down the schools for a month from uh, early October till about the same time in November. And uh, the school of population was getting so low that they almost closed it before Christmas. Then it was February before they were able to open it again. And almost all of the younger people had to flee. That's interesting. Uh, I lost a classmate. Did you? I was living in... Um, Washington State then, and uh, I remember we moved just before Thanksgiving, and I went to school uh, for a while, and then they closed it. So the epidemic evidently hit here before it hit out west. Yeah. Okay. I remember we had to wear asafetity bags yeah. around our necks. And, and we had to wear a mask. Did you? Did you ever wear an asafetity bag? <laughs> no. <laughs> Nor I. I wonder if that ever actually did any good. It, I don't think it so. It kept other people That's away. Well, sure. Uh, uh, was there a doctor in the fort at that time? No. Has there ever been one? No, not to my knowledge. Uh -huh. So then when you had a serious illness, so you had to hitch up the horses or the wagon or the car and go to Woodstock or Front Royal? No. No? <laughs> what would you do? You got on the telephone, the doctor came to see you. Oh! They don't do that nowadays. No? Well, did you have hospitals in this area? Where was your nearest hospital? Winchester. Winchester. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if you had to go to the hospital, uh, back before we had uh, lots of cars, how would you get there, back when you had a team of horses? Go from here to... Uh, Water lick and catch a train or something, or how would you get there? I wouldn't know. They just about didn't use hospitals. Uh huh. Wasn't there kind of a fear about hospitals in those days? If you well, went to the hospital, you died. You came you, out. Yeah, yeah you. Yeah. When you went to the hospital, you died. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh, comment was made here, but before we interviewed you about uh, the wildlife in the valley, and you said that. Uh, Something to the effect that you thought we had more now than we did then. Can you tell us something about that? I know there's definitely more deer, more bear, and more turkey than there was when I was a child. And I understand that there's more in the state of Virginia now than there was when the white man first came. Is that right? Do you have any idea why that might be? Wildlife management partly, and partly because it's been opened up and there's more food for them on the farms than there was in the woodlands. Mm -hmm. Mm 
Do you have some old stories you've heard about uh, wildlife? Oh, I've heard about uh, such things as panther, which we almost never hear now, but I think three times since I've been here we've heard the panther. The when you say you heard a panther, you mean you heard one cry yeah. or you heard about a panther? Heard one cry. Uh -huh. They're really, they're the black leopard, mm -hmm. a very vicious beast. What's about the story about the fellow that three seconds they told a story about the man, and I can't tell you who it was, it was before my day, for going over a mountain trail with his horse to Strasburg to take part in a shooting match and won a side of beef. And he came back, and night overtook him before he got home. And he came across the mountain. He heard someone call back the way he answered him. Called again. He answered again, and stopped to wait a bit, and after the bit he decided it wasn't the person, he, it was a panther, so he didn't wait any longer, he headed for home as fast as his old horse would take him. When he got nearly there, the panther was getting pretty close, but he had a couple hunting dogs, they wouldn't come close to the panther, but they got close enough to slow him down a little, and he got to his cabin, which is only a hundred yards or two above where the house here now lives. And the panther was just about on him. He let the horse go and threw the side of beef down, went into the house and got his muzzle loading gun, which was always loaded, and shot the panther on the beef. <laughs> My say. Well, that was interesting. Boy, that was exciting, wasn't it? Yeah. Do you have another story or two you can tell us? Not like that one. No. <laughs> I can't vouch for it, but the way it was told, I suspect it probably happened. Yes, yes. Well, when was the last time that you can recall that they ever heard or saw a panther here in Fort Valley? That you heard or saw? Mm, I expect it's been 20 years. 20 years. Has there ever been any wolves in here? Yes. But, uh... Probably not for 75 years. Uh -huh. oh. Now, would those have been... Uh, they were timber wolves. Timber wolves. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, now, Mr. Boyer, do you have anything else that you uh, uh, like to tell us about your experiences here in Fort Valley? You, uh, when you were a boy, you'd work a day for a day uh, uh, full-time. What was your pay? Run mostly... 75 cents to a dollar. Uh -huh. In fact, a dollar a day was uh, wages for hired help as late as the 1930s. Gee, you wouldn't get that now. No, my wife's home, 50 cents a day. <laughs> when, they could find, when they could find work. You know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. They had a lot of competition from blacks, I suppose, there. Yeah. Which you didn't have, did you? Mm -hmm. And the only cash income that the sharecropper, be he white or black, had was at cotton picking time. Mm -hmm. So they'd start school a little early. When the cotton got ready to pick, they'd close school so that the children all could pick cotton. You saying that they raised cotton here? No. no. This was in North My North wife's North. home in oh, South Carolina. Oh, oh, I see. That's understood. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, the main crops here when you were a boy, the main cash crop was wheat. Was wheat, uh -huh. and for a hundred years before. And then you raised some corn for cattle feed. Uh, Mostly to feed the horses. Uh, yeah. yeah. Cattle got very little of it. How many bushels a week with the wheat? Going? The virgin land would run anywhere from 25 to 40 bushels to the acre. And they wore it out. Well, until after the Civil War, they they didn't use fertilizer, but the erosion took the topsoil off of most of these hills, and it got down to 10 or 15 bushels was considered a good yield. Mm -hmm. And now we've just discontinued. There's almost no wheat growth. Uh, Mr. Boyer, one thing that, that I've noticed here, and I've talked to Bill about it in the past, you don't see any fruit trees to amount to anything. Is it, were they ever grown here? And if so, why are they not here now? More than they are now. There are more fruit trees in there? 
they were they were not as good varieties as we have now, but uh, they were more winter hardy and they stood the frost better. Our modern varieties are more susceptible to frost. And uh, what were some of the varieties of apples that we had here that you grew here that was hardy? Oh, we had maiden blush. We had early harvest. And yeah, this old sour red astrakhan. Uh-huh. Yeah. Sourest apple you ever. Is that right? <laughs> They're from Russia, you know. Yeah, I expect that's true. Right. Well, it probably is, but I don't know its variety. What's a hundred years old? A little old pear tree out oh. here, and the big one is their sickle pears. Mm -hmm. Still very. Yes, I know. But uh, the hilltops, they chose their places for them, and, but they'd get apples most years, and we found out from experience if we got an apple crop every second or third year of the modern varieties, you were doing pretty well. And peaches about one year and four or five. And just not worth was that because of the cold weather? The late frost. Late frost. Mm -hmm. And the fact that the varieties had uh, been bred differently, hadn't they? Yeah, they didn't take as much of it. And I believe that they bloom earlier. Well, anything else that you can think of that we'd like to go ahead, you'd like to have on this tape? Yes, could you tell something about the politics here in the valley? I don't know. I, I heard some of them say it was always democratic before the Civil War and uh, that after the Civil War that uh, Virginia went Republican the first time in 1868 and uh, one lady told her and said, did you hear? Said, Virginia went black. <laughs> <laughs> went uh, that's pretty good. Oh, yes. <laughs> Basically, the uh, Fort Valley is still Republican, isn't it? Among the older. I think it is now, but I think uh, that it used to be Democratic. You know? Of course, when you say Democratic here, you're talking about a conservative Democratic Party that... They always were conservative. Very much so. I think farmers were always conservative, don't you? I think so. Individualists, they didn't want to have uh, too much Drop regulation them. here. Uh, That's right. Anything else, Mr. Boyer or Bill? Want to raise a question? Uh, what about sports activities? Did uh, Fort Valley have a baseball team, for example? No. That's kind of uh, curious, isn't it? We did have a very good brass band. Oh, did you? Oh, how large was that? I'd say 25 or 30 pieces. That's right. That's good. Very good. That's where I heard the first male quartet. There's um, four of the members of the band. They'd play a few pieces and then they'd sing a couple. Ah. Huh? Who organized it? Who was the conductor? I believe Tommy Crable. Now, I could be an heir on huh? that. Well, if you had a excuse me, if you had a if you had a band here, did you ever have a dance band? And if so, where did they dance? There weren't. There wasn't. Somebody told me that there was uh, a dance hall up there at uh, uh, Little Fort on a Sunday, kind of a pavilion, used to dance. Well, at the organization camp, I wouldn't. No, no, at the Little Fort. Where the campground is? Yeah, the Little Fort campground up in that area. No? Well, I've been misinformed. Yeah. Well, anything else, Mr. Boyer? I think I've not covered it. <laughs> well, can we come back if you think of some more stuff? Sure, anytime. All right. Well, this is uh, an interview of Ernest Boyer sitting on his front porch on August of 1978. And with us is his wife, Lucille, and a friend, Bill Evans, and this is Marlon Krauss. Thank you.